Welcome, I'm Alan Hall, President and CEO of WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. And in this tutorial, we're gonna talk about compliance to 14 CFR 25581, which is to deal with aircraft structures of part 25 aircraft. Now there are a couple of key points here as we go through this tutorial. There are three parts to the regulation, three parts of the regulation. There are four documents which you need to go get. And then there are five steps to compliance. Remember three, four, five, uh, as we go through this presentation, just so you remember, hey, there's only three parts of the regulation, there's four documents I gotta go get, and then there's five steps of compliance. So let's get started. So 14 CFR 25581 regulation states in part A, this is one of three parts, A, the airplane must be protected against catastrophic effects from lightning. Now, catastrophic effects are obviously the loss of the aircraft and, and most likely of its crew and passengers. It's very serious things here. Uh, this picture is from a lightning crash around 2000, and lightning related crash from 2003. Lightning struck the, the empennage, caused some problems in the, in the flight control system. Uh, they were fortunate enough to get it back to, to the runway, but they still had a very serious accident there. Lightning strikes, damage that are, are, are result in sort of catastrophic events are rare, but they still do exist. That means we as the design engineers need to be on top of this and make sure we're doing the right things for compliance. So let's look at part two of the regulation B for metallic components. Compliance with paragraph A of this section may be shown by one, bonding the components properly to the airframe, or two, designing the components so that a strike will not endanger the airplane. Now I give two examples here. One is a strike to a King Air wing, which wrinkled up the wing tip, and then actually wrinkled parts of the wing and the fuselage from the lightning strike. It's a pretty strong lightning strike. And then uh, a more common case here is a lightning strike to a rivet on an airplane where it just melts the head of the rivet. So there's kind of two extremes here. But uh, in both cases, the design incorporated bonding and then try to uh, other features that help minimize the effects of the strike, right? So let's go to part three of the regulation, non-metallic components. C, for non-metallic components, compliance with paragraph A of this section may be shown by one, designing the components to minimize the effect of a strike. And in this particular case, we show a carbon fiber wingtip that has incorporated metal foil on the outside to minimize the effects of a strike. So that's a very common design technique, putting some conductivity on the outside of a piece of carbon fiber structure to minimize the effect. Part two of this is incorporating acceptable means of diverting the resulting electrical current so as not to endanger the airplane. Now in this particular case, what we see is a nose radium for an Airbus airplane. Nose radiums are typically made out of fiberglass or Kevlar, they're non-conductive. And so in this particular case, what is done is there's actually a copper strip that's applied to the outside of the radome to divert the current safely back to the airframe. So in both cases, in minimizing the, the effect of, of a strike or in diverting it, when you get to talk about non-metallic uh, structure or components, that's, those are really the two compliance methods that the regulation points out, all right? So those are the three parts to the regulation. Now, let's look at the documents you're gonna need. And there are four documents in which you're gonna need to go get. ARP 5577, Aircraft Lightning Direct Effect Certification. ARP 5414, Aircraft Lightning Zone. ARP 5412, Aircraft Lightning Environment and Related Test Waveforms. And the last document is ARP 5416, Aircraft Lightning Test Methods. All right, so those are the four documents. Now, you can find those documents at sae.org online. They do cost a couple of dollars to acquire, so you know you're gonna make an investment here, but you're gonna need all four of those documents if you're dealing with 25581. All right, now we get down to the five steps to show compliance. All right, so let's walk through them. And they're described in general in ARP 5577. I simplified them a little bit because I think 5577 can get a little bit complicated and it shouldn't be that complicated. So one, we need to determine the lightning strike zones for the aircraft. So we need to figure out where lightning is likely to attach the airplane. Two, we need to establish a lightning environment. So if lightning strikes the wingtip, how much energy is gonna be applied to that, to that wingtip part? Three, perform a lightning hazard assessment. So we need to determine what the likely outcome of a lightning strike to a particular component is to make sure 
that we understand what the implications are for the safety of the aircraft. Four, we need to design protection, right? So we figured out a part of the airplane may be vulnerable. We need to apply some sort of protection to it, design that into the part. And then five is the verification step, right? So those are the five steps to compliance to 25581. Okay, so step one of our five-step process here is lightning strike zones and defining what the lightning strike zones are for the aircraft. The place you need to go is ARP 5414. That's gonna define the aircraft zones for most aircraft. Now, just to simplify it a little bit, I broke it into the, the three basic zones, zone one, zone two, and zone three. Zone one are the extremities, the nose, the wingtips, the empennage tips. Zone two tends to be the main body, the fuselage, uh, parts of the wing, and then the empennage also, tail. And then zone three is everywhere else, right? So uh, big portions of the wing or lightning zone three. Lightning zone three is a place where lightning is not likely to attach, right? So those are the less likely probabilities of lightning to attach. Zone one is where lightning is most likely going to initially attach. Zone two are the areas where lightning will, will, has a low likelihood of initial attachment, but will, lightning may attach during the lightning event. So uh, a strike to the nose as the aircraft moves forward, uh, that strike will move down the fuselage. So the initial strike zone was, would have been the nose, which would have been zone one, and then the fuselage is in lightning zone two. So just to break it down simply, okay? So then we're going to go to step two, which is looking at the lightning environment, defining the lightning environment. Okay, so that's in ARP 5412. That associates the lightning zones with particular amounts of voltages and currents. Just to keep it simple here for the purposes of this exercise, zone one can experience up to 200,000 amps. Lightning zone two can experience 100,000 amps. And unique and novel features in lightning zone three, like in the middle of a wing, if you had some sort of um, mount or something out there on a wing, uh, the SAE group recommends testing it to 40,000 amps. So those are the three generic levels. Just get, kind of get a relative sense of... of Lightning zone one is 200,000 amps. Lightning zone two is 100,000 amps. Lightning zone three is 40,000 amps. The third step is the lightning hazard assessment. And this is where you want to spend most of your time. So you want to do an evaluation of the lightning damage, potential lightning damage. You want to look at all aircraft structures, systems, and components. And you want to determine if there could be some sort of catastrophic effect a failure or a malfunction, and it can happen immediately or after some delay. So for example, a strike to a wingtip could cause the wingtip to deform to the point where it bumps into an aileron, and you may not notice it until later in the flight. Or you have a strike to a flap, for example, and you don't really deploy the flaps until later in the flight. So you may not even know that the flap has been damaged. So that the damage may be immediate, but the effect may be further on down the, down the flight profile, right? And we're looking at primary structure for the most part. We'll talk about some other areas we're going to look at, but the focus right now is primary structure. If we're looking at those things, if they took substantial lightning damage, may cause the, the loss of the aircraft, all right? So there's two documents we're going to look at, the FAA documents, and those are free, which is 14 CFR 25571 and the, and the advisory circular that goes along with it, AC 25571-1C and which looks at damage tolerance and fatigue evaluation. So you want to do a little research on that and talk to your structures person. If you're not a structures person, talk to a structures person about uh, evaluating those structures. And then you want to look at structural components. Now, that could be fasteners and major structural joints like a wing spar, uh, a vertical stabilizer spar. You want to look at control surfaces, push rods, cables, actuator hinges, bond jumpers, uh, so things that kind of bring structures together uh, from a systems perspective. And then externally mounted components like antennas or radomes, where if an antenna exploded from a lightning event, does it get sucked into an engine or do you have a, have a radome that departs and hits a vertical stabilizer? Those are pretty important to figure out ahead of time and determine how you want to protect them. Also look at a loss of a system function, particularly mechanical systems. So the loss of protection of an underlying system because the outside has been struck. So a, a simple case in points is an engine cowling is protecting a, a FADEC, a full authority digital electronic control for an engine. If the cowling gets hit and the cowling comes apart, does that expose the underlying FADEC to things that wouldn't normally see? Uh, and then when you also look at, you know, look at primary power, does a strike take out primary power? Is a strike to a light 
on a wingtip, take out the aircraft power, or a strike somewhere to maybe a hydraulic tube that may be exposed on the trailing edge of an elevator, does that cause you problems later on in terms of system? Now, the evaluation I'm going to do here is based on 20, AC 25-1309-1A. Now, the process is like it. It's not the same thing, right? We're not saying you're going to do a 1301, 1309 analysis for lightning. That won't happen, but the process is similar. So you'll, you'll hear engineers talk about doing a 1309 approach on lightning protection. What we're saying is we're going to follow the same guidelines and sort of the guidance and how we think about what systems may be affected and what the consequences of damage or, fi or failure of a component will have on the rest of the aircraft, on the safety of the aircraft. So we, we try to classify and create a lightning safety classification system. Hey, these things, if they get struck, may have a catastrophic effect. This may be hazardous, this may be major, this may be minor. And then to determine the kind of the components and hardware that we want to go look at and sp spend uh, more time evaluating. Step four, design protection for metallic components, right? So in, on, a, on a metal part, what are we looking at in terms of uh, design protection? We want to know what that metal is is aluminum steel or titanium they're all different resistances they all respond differently to lightning energy we're going to look at the thickness and the cross-sectional area right? is it thick enough to handle the lightning energy we're going to look at how it's attached so if there's two metal pieces that are stuck together are they riveted are they screwed together are they bolted are they welded are they adhesively bonded together that has a big difference uh, in terms of what the possible damage would be to those parts. We look at coatings and then electrical bonding kind of go together, which is are the parts allodyne between them, so there's a conduct conductive coating between them. Are they anodized or painted where there's a non-conductive coating between them? Non-conductive coatings uh, tend to do more damage to a component when and during a lightning event because there's not a dedicated path for lightning to travel, so lightning makes its own, and when it does, it causes a lot of a lot of extra damage. And then on the non-metallic components, we're looking at similar things. What is the material? Is it carbon fiber or is it fiberglass typically? How thick is it? Is it a 787 wing section or is it a, a much lighter uh, cross-section area? It tend to be like on fairings and that sort of thing where they tend to be very, very thin. Metal foils, a lot of times metal foils are being used uh, to protect composite structures, be it fiberglass or carbon fiber. Typical things are copper, bronze, aluminum, or even silver coatings, paint coatings. We see a lot more of that recently. Uh, and then and if you're gonna divert lightning energy or strike type lightning diverters is a very common way to do that. And then we also wanna look at um, how those composite parts are attached to one another. A lot of times it's be a, a non-conductive adhesive, or sometimes it's some sort of screw or bolt or fastener that holds those parts together. You can get a sense of what likely what the likely damage is and what's at risk there. If you burn out some fasteners, do you then not have enough structure to carry the load? Things you need to think about when you're dealing with carbon fiber or fiberglass parts. And then electrical bonding. There is electrical bonding issues with uh non-conductive or highly resistive things like carbon fiber, you know, you still want to make connections where you can to, to safely carry the lightning current. All right, so step five, which is uh, probably the most expensive step of all, which is to verify compliance. So that's primarily done with lightning testing. And the best thing to do that I that I do, depending on where the our, our customer is, is to just check Google and see what's close. Like you, you like to get a lightning lab that's competent, one, and two, it's relatively close to your facility, just it saves you a bunch of time travel, right? Google's the best way to look. Um, there are lightning labs across the world. Find one uh, online is the best thing, reach out to them try to you know work something out in terms of doing a test but there's a lot of guidance in the in the SAE documents about doing those tests uh, I always find that building a relationship with a, a, a lightning lab is a good thing long term analysis is another approach on metallic parts and some uh, basic carbon fiber or fiberglass parts that have standard lightning protection there are really two documents you can use and the FAA would allow you to use them on their face, which is the DOT FAA CT-89-22, which is the Aircraft Lightning Protection Handbook. And you'll see that referenced in a number of advisory circulars from the FAA. So they like to point back to this. So if you need some help on an analysis side or determining melt through on a piece of aluminum, it's gonna point you back to that book. 
And then the Agate Lightning Direct Effects Handbook, which Ed Rupke put together from Lightning Technologies. That is a great handbook in the sense that Ed did a lot of testing on carbon fiber and fiberglass parts protected with a variety of very common lightning protection foils and protection methods and documented that so that becomes a reference for industry. Now we can pull that out and use it uh, to, to validate our design. Uh, you know, you obviously want to take a conservative approach there, but you can validate your design based on the stuff that's in that agate, agate uh, handbook there. The last thing is similarity. A lot of companies, uh, bigger aircraft companies like an Embraer or an Airbus or a Boeing, even Cessna, Cirrus, well, they have a lot of data already. Uh, we'll use similarity because they have test data as a foundation and then they have a new component which is similar so they'll, they'll justify the, the design that way. So similarity gets used a lot for the, the for sort of existing designs and, and things that have transferred from one aircraft model to another. So those are the five steps, all right? Uh, complicated a little bit, yes. Manageable, totally yes. So if you have questions about lightning protection of uh, metal or carbon fiber or fiberglass parts here at WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. We're here to help. Check us out on our website, www.weatherguardaero.com.